My name is Gordon Lautz. I'm a professor of glycobiology at the University of Zagreb and founder of the Genus Glycoscience Research Laboratory, as well as the director of the Human Glycom Project. I will present you glycanage, something we believe is the best biomarker of biological age. For nearly 30 years, I'm working in the field of glycobiology, and most of the time it feels like revealing the dark matter of biology because glycans are the ultimate layer of molecular complexity, but at the same time, the most neglected molecules of cellular communication. And one of the best examples of this happened a couple of months ago in the peak of a COVID pandemic, when the director of NIH in his blog presented as a glycoprotein of the SARS virus as only peptide without any glycans, while instead the surface of the S glycoprotein is more glycan than the peptide. And this is the case of the majority of proteins. Majority of proteins are glycosylated and our motto is see the complete picture, include glycans in your study. But glycan analysis is very complicated. Glycans are complex branched molecules which cannot be amplified in a lab. So you have to do a many chemical steps to analyze a small amount of biological sample and this is extremely difficult in high throughput manner. Actually, there are only two labs in the world which routinely do high throughput glycomic studies. One is the Leiden University Medical Center and the other one is GANOS. With over 150,000 analyzed samples, GANOS is one of the global leaders in high throughput glycomics, but not only because of the number of samples, but because these samples came from some of the best phenotype and genotype cohorts in the world, including the Twins UK cohort, where we analyzed over 20,000 glycoms so far. Most of the analysis we did were with the leading researchers from different institutions all around the world, which helped us to raise glycomics to the level where we are able to publish in high profile journals. So in the last couple of years, we have a multiple publications in Nature Communications, Nature Chemical Biology, three gastroenterology papers, nucleic acid research, circulation, circulation research. So actually, while until a couple of years ago, it was really difficult to study, a to publish a glycomic study in a high profile journal. Now doing proper glycan analysis actually helps our clinical colleagues to publish their studies in a leading journals. And one of the first things we learned from high tropical glycomic studies is that glycans actually highly correlate with age. What we did a couple of years ago was to study over 5,000 people from four different cohorts where we learned that younger people have more glycans which look like this, which act as an anti-inflammatory glycans and suppress inflammation, while older people would have glycans which look like this and they actually promote inflammation. So glycans change with age. And actually, if we put only information about the glycans on IgG in our model, we can predict age of a person plus minus nine years. Now, guessing a chronological age with an error of nine years does not seem to be very accurate. But actually, if we would be predicting a chronological age too accurately, which is, for example, happened with the methylation clock, which guesses the age plus minus one year, then this does not give a lot of additional information. Actually, even Steve Horvath is now developing a new advanced methylation clocks because the original one does not give a lot of biological information. And also the other commercial uh, methylation clocks are based on a different set of markers which correlates with the original methylation clock, but it's very hard to know what is the difference between the actually measured methylation age and the biological age or what does it mean? For glycans, we know that the difference between the chronological age and the glycan age associates with a number of different biomarkers of unhealthy life. So if one is living a healthy life, his, his or her glycan age would be lower than a person who lives an unhealthy life. Also, we did a large study with over 27 populations all around the world and correlated 
glycon composition with the expected lifespan in that specific region. And we found a very high correlation between the glycan age and the expected lifespan, actually between the difference between the glycan age and the chronological age and the expected lifespan. So people living in the regions where expected lifespan would be shorter will have a higher relative glycan age compared to people living in a region where the expected lifespan would be longer. Also, by looking at the thousands and thousands of patients with different diseases, we learned that effects of aging, which are these last four bars in all of the plots, are similar to the changes which we see in people with different diseases. So this is not an effect of a disease because we see it in many different diseases, but this is actually a reflection of biological process, which we will believe to be a low-grade chronic inflammation, which is contributing to the development of these diseases. The way David Sinclair and I summarized this in a recent editorial in Aging, we said that the glycan age integrates genetic, epigenetic, and environmental information into a single uh, biomarker, into a single value, which can be reliably quantified. So actually, you have a single measure, which includes genetic, epigenetic, and environmental aspects of aging. But even more importantly, these glycans are not only biomarkers, they're actually functional effectors which contribute to the function of the immune system and to the aging of the immune system. And this is regulated in a very complex manner, which we map through a series of GWAS papers in the last decade and showed that there are over 40 genes which regulate IgG glycosylation, meaning there are 40 genes which make a decision which kind of glycan we are going to put on our immunoglobulins and what kind of function these immunoglobulins are going to have. And we have also shown that if there is something wrong with these genes, if there are mutations in the genes which regulate IgG glycosylation, this is highly pleiotropic with a number of different conditions, including diseases like lupus or diabetes or even dementia. And when we looked into the patients with these diseases, and this, this uh, review from uh, two years ago lists over 300 references. Glycans in patients are also changed, but not only change in the patients, they also change before people actually develop disease. Because one of the problems in modern medicine is that people go to hospital when they are really ill. When there is something wrong, when some of the organ systems are not functioning, we feel pain and then we go to hospital. And this is usually too late because this is a very late stage of a disease. So it's usually very difficult to completely cure the problem. Usually we are just curing the symptoms. But if we could identify these people some way on this path, if we could find them when only there are some molecular changes, but not a disease manifestation already, then maybe a preventive intervention, a simple lifestyle change would be enough to prevent the disease. For example, we know that IgG glycom associates with hypertension. So people with hypertension will have a change in glycosylation, but we see the same change already in pre-hypertension. Also in a series of experiments we did together with Phil Scholl from UT Southwestern, we managed to show that these changes are actually causative and that you, in mice, you can prevent it by simple feeding mice with manosamine. In humans, it's a little bit more complex. You cannot just feed humans manosamine to resolve the the high blood pressure, but what we see in humans, we see that the IgG glycom changes associate with the cardiovascular risk score. So this was a large study over three and a half thousand people in UK, where we show that people who have changes in glycans, which go in this direction of old age, have also the higher cardiovascular disease risk score. This was a correlation, so it's very hard to know whether this is causative, but then we did another study with over 27,000 people collected in Germany over 20 years ago, followed for 10 years. And in this period, over 500 of them had either heart attack or, stro or stroke. And then we looked at the glycans at the baseline and found that they're actually more predictive of the future heart attack or stroke than any other biomarker. But we know 
that living a healthy life is increasing our lifespan and we will have healthier, longer life. But people still don't do it. People do not change their life habits, despite knowing that some of them do damage. And probably they don't do it because it's difficult. For example, it is difficult to be on a diet. For example, this monkey on the left has been on a diet for over a decade. And he does look healthier than the other mouse, or the other monkey which had a normal diet, but it doesn't look happy. And to be able to do a difficult decisions, to be able to exercise or go on a diet, people need motivation. People need something which will tell them that what they're doing is actually working and only waiting until you die does not really help. And what we hope is that the glycan age can help and motivate people to make a difficult decisions to live healthier life because they could see an immediate effect. They could immediately see that, for example, somebody is younger than the chronological age. So glycan age would give them first an objective insight into the current state of biological age, or at least the low grade chronic inflammation. And also this would give them a quantitative tool, which would be able to evaluate the effects of lifestyle interventions. Because we all know what is good. It's important to sleep, not to be under stress, to have a healthy diet, to have a reasonable physical activity. But we generally don't do it because we don't know how important it is and what kind of effects will it have. And if we can track it, and these graphs below show my personal glycan age through time, we see that it is increasing beside these periods when it went down. So what happened here, I actually was losing weight. So for me personally, diet is the most important component. So I'm this unlucky monkey which has to go on caloric restriction. But some other people maybe need to sleep more or to be less under stress or be more physically active, which would actually help them. And the glycan age gives them a tool to see what actually works and what does not work. So to summarize my presentation, at the moment we have a glycan age biomarker already on the market. We are selling direct to consumer, but also to the large clinical trials, which are performing additional research. This current glycan age is measuring glycans immunoglobulin G. So it's more of an immunoglycan age, where we know that people are pro-inflammatory when they're old, anti-inflammatory when they're young, and a different lifestyle intervention can actually change it. Something what we are developing now, and actually we are developing it really quickly at the moment, is something we call the metabolic glycan age, and it measures the different types of glycans, which are more related to metabolic health, to diet, to obesity, because this is something which seems to be a risk factor for severe COVID-19. And this is something what is very important at the moment.